Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Ilse Samarripa and this is The World Space. Today we have an outstanding guest. His name is Richard Lico. He is a great video game animator working in projects like Star Wars Jedi Academy, Halo 3, Halo Reach, Destiny, Moss and many others. Hey my dear Rick, how is it going? Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey Elsa, it's good to see you. Uh, thanks for having me on. This is a, a real pleasure being here. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, really. It's a pleasure to see you. So I wanted to talk to you about while animating for TV or cinema, the goal is to tell the story through a character. In games, the goal is different because the animation becomes more about interacting with the player. What have you learned about guiding a player and working this interconnection between animated character and player? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Elsa. <laughs> so. You know, film and gameplay animators, they're, they're actually a lot alike in some respects. Broadcast, I'll just call it broadcast animation. Broadcast animators have to worry about character performance, um, drawing emotions from their, their viewers, yeah. telling a story. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that they have to worry about that us gameplay animators, we have to worry about as well. Mm -hmm. But like you mentioned, we have the added opportunity slash complication mm -hmm. of including uh, player intent in in our you know in the way we plan our animations the way we execute and that adds a lot of complexity that film animators and broadcast animators don't have to worry about yeah. tricky because we provide them with a set of inputs whether they're controller inputs or keyboard or, or vr you're reaching in and touching things mm -hmm. it's it's a form of communication that they're taking part in and we define as game designers and game developers what those inputs are. So in the case of Moss, she can swing a sword, for example, when you press the attack button. And we're setting up this, this rule with the player. This X button here, this will cause Quill to attack. Then when they want Quill to attack, they press that button. So we understand their intent. But context is tricky. And what does attack mean when she's falling? What does attack mean when she's standing still? What does attack mean when they're pushing in a direction and then press it? There's a lot of situations where their intent and the input scheme we have set up, the inputs aren't exact enough to really understand what they want the character to do in a given situation. So we have to really pay attention to that context and then animate our characters, not only to show personality, to draw motion and all that kind of stuff, but also communicate properly with our players. When she's falling, she has to do a diving attack. When she's standing still, it's a stand in place, don't lunge. And when she's moving and attacking, it's a lunge in the direction you're moving. Or swing in the opposite direction if they quickly move their direction on the stick and then press attack. And it's a lot of hard work trying to anticipate what player intent needs to be. And I think that's what makes the best gameplay animators, is they're not just assigning animation clips to a button, they're building performances based on the anticipation of what the player ideally would like out of that button press. If it's done properly, like if, if us as animators, if we build proper animations in and we, we really anticipate what those players are looking for, then, then we're building a deeper bond with our participants than broadcast animation has the opportunity to do. So for example, when in Moss, like you, you spend time reaching into the world, feeling her heartbeat by grabbing her in VR. You know, you can wave to her and she'll wave back. So we have inputs that a lot of the traditional games don't have the opportunity to do, which is really cool. But you know, you know, she's still reacting to a jump or a sword swipe or whatever buttons you have in your controllers. And we're building that relationship because we've got our players' attention. They're deeply engaged in the way she acts based on what they're doing. And the more she anticipates properly what the player's thinking, the more bonded they feel with Quill. So that, that's more than just a good cinematic performance. So that's anticipating you know, where they expect her to land when she jumps, right? So we can pay that off in certain ways, in certain scenes. So when you have to fight this big snake at the end of Moss, and you know, you're going through this fight, and there's a high likelihood that Quill has died multiple times, with you at the controls um, in the process of fighting the snake. So by the end of the fight, the player is likely going to be very frustrated. So I animated Quill to just kick that snake. Now, plenty of film or broadcast characters will do that type of thing to an enemy that they've defeated. But there's not that personal engagement associated with a, a broadcast character doing it that a game character has. Because in that situation, Quill is reflecting back onto our players 
what they're feeling. And they're feeling it because they're deeply engaged in this input scheme and this, this two-way communication that a, a game itself has. And that's just pivotal to really making people feel involved in the universe, feel immersed in their experience. Yeah, I think that connection between character and player is, is the key. Okay, so on that note, let's speak about Halo Reach and Destiny. In the latter, you were the animator who set the tone and the direction of the gameplay, right? The early days? <laughs> oh man, Destiny, the early days. Yeah, and it was a long time ago now, but um, you know, at the time I was working on Halo Reach as the animation lead. And uh, we, were, we were finishing off that project, we were almost done with it, um, and it was going to be our last game under the Microsoft banner. We were breaking away to, to become our own studio and, and find our own way in, in the world. And Destiny was going to be our first game into this new world of self-publish or finding another publisher thing. At the time, we didn't even have Activision under our belt. We didn't know we'd be publishing with them. So there was a small group working in the, the back of 434, you know, Kirkland Way, whatever that was, the, the downtown Kirkland office, and they were working on some game that they called Destiny, and they, you know, they didn't really have too much to go off of yet. They had some rough ideas and big plans, lots of awesome concept art. And they, they called me up there, and they, they showed me what they had, and they asked me what I thought their character should be like, and how they should move, and what type of tone and theme we should have for our animation aesthetics, and I eventually rolled over full-time working on that as the very first animator. And it was a, a really amazing learning experience for me. Because in the past I'd worked on some IPs that were brand new, like Condemned, and I helped bring them to life, but I had never been the very first animator on the project before, and I had never been in a leadership role in that situation before. So it was, it was really amazing being right there at the ground level of this huge IP now, like everyone knows Destiny now and not knowing what it was and trying to figure that out. Some of the, the best parts of figuring it out were trying to understand, like given our technical limitations and the idea that it was going to be a first person game, even back then we weren't too sure of sci-fi, but we were kind of leaning in that direction. Like within those confines, how is it different from Halo yet? How is it familiar to players? Like what do we carry over from Halo that we learned? And what's going to be new? And how do we make that gameplay feel so fluid and so satisfying. That was the thing that I, I caught on to most where like the the third person abilities, they were actually all in first person at first and then we switched over and moved the entire game all over to third person and realized well that's not working so then we decided to mix the two because third person we can show more like we can play to a hero fantasy better in third person on some of the super abilities and whatnot than we could in first person. So we, we explored all that and we got to really figure out what the three classes felt like and, and how they played to the, the different combatants and then I got to help set tone for the combatants and, and train up the animation team and get them all involved in the universe and have them help you know, design and, and imagine this entire world and how it all moves and how our characters behave. And it was just an amazing experience. Um, and I'm so thankful that so many people have embraced the world of Destiny and um, even though I've long since moved on, it's been over four years since I left Bungie, mm -hmm. you know, I still fondly look at that time as like a highlight of my career. Another awesome game you worked in and my generation grew up playing is Jedi Academy. It's impressive how 15 years later it still has one of the best lightsaber combats up to date, according to everybody, and that's mostly thanks to you. <laughs> You, you remember Jedi Academy? Oh, that's, of course I that's, do. That's impressive. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm really glad you like that game because, you know, back when, when I was working on it, we were just having a good old time making it. <laughs> Jedi Academy was my first big game, um, and it was my first game with Ravensaw. Uh, mm -hmm. The lightsaber combat was actually done um, originally in Jedi Knight, mm -hmm. uh, which was the game that took place before Jedi Academy. And it was just one single lightsaber. Like, they didn't have the, the staff, they didn't have the dual blades. It was just one single lightsaber, and it was kind of, I mean, the game was great. It was a huge narrative experience, and a lot of people probably still love Jedi Knight uh, to this day. But the, the combat was pretty basic. There wasn't too much to it. It was really a great template, mm -hmm. uh, prototype, for what the, the, event, the combat would eventually become in Jedi Academy. And it was my job to actually do all of the new lightsaber combats. <laughs> what I did was I took a look at all the animations that they had from the first game, and then figured out, okay, within the confines of, of how the, the gameplay systems work, 
what animations could I do with a dual saber set or a staff set? And then what type of new moves would we want to add? And then retrofit the, the old single saber to that. Wow. So we did a lot of like backflipping off of walls. We did a lot of wall running. We did some sync actions where the two characters would beat each other up, um, tied together. And back then, that was unheard of. There wasn't many sync action networked games before where they'd tie together kind of like Batman Arkham games do now. And it's really common now, but back then it really wasn't. Um, so it's it was just so much fun to be able to come up with like what the backflip would look like and, and how the lightsabers would react and how they'd kind of struggle and ping off of one another. And man, it was just, God, I loved animating that. That was, I really cut my teeth on body mechanics and gameplay and I learned so much working on that game. And it's outstanding to, to see how video games have developed in such a short amount of time, right? Yeah, I know, right? It's it's amazing how far everything has come. And you know, when I when I started out, it was the year 2000. And back then, I was using 3D Studio Max and IK was this brand new technology, right? Character Studio was this new hot thing. And uh, in-game animation was mostly 2D back then. 3D was still kind of emerging. The PlayStation was still a thing. and. The Xbox was about to come out when I first started. You weren't seeing a whole lot of 3D games, and where there was 3D in games, it was usually really low poly characters that didn't have a skeletal structure in them. It was just vertex animation. They only had like two to three hundred vertices at best. You know, it was it was insanely low, and the amount of memory you had for these animations was so minuscule. That's why when you see the in-game events for Final Fantasy VII, the original on the PlayStation, <laughs> yeah. these like tiny little sprite characters, like little low poly characters and they have these very short repetitive clips because there was just just a tiny bit of, of RAM that they can use to load these these animations into. Now 20 years later look at the Unreal 5 engine demo that they just released and it's mind-blowing it really is it's just what they're able to do now and the new animation technologies that are out there, like the, the motion warping that, that Epic is working on. The uh, Unity's work, working with the, the bi-directional animation sampling, where you can do modular rigging on the fly as you animate inside of Unity. It's insane. David Hunt talks about it in his recent uh, GDC, GDC talk from this year. It's, it's online for free. But it's, it's amazing, like, being a part of all of that, mm -hmm. that 20 years of progress, it just feels like I have whiplash all the time because <laughs> it's always something new to consider and always something new to think about yeah. and something new to learn. So it keeps, keeps life interesting. And how about the technical and aesthetical differences of working between 3D gaming, augmented reality and virtual reality? What are some advantages and disadvantages of this way of animating? You know, that that's such a, a good question. and I'm so glad you asked that because, you know, I've been doing VR gameplay animation for four years now. Yeah. I joined Polyarch a little over four years ago. And and I don't want to go back mm -hmm. to non-VR or non-AR, if that's the case, ever again. Because it's the creative freedom that you have once you're in these mixed reality spaces is mesmerizing. Like, now I can actually reach in and grab Quill and, and feel her heartbeat. I can wave to her. I can talk to her, she'll hear me. Like, mm. There's a lot of different ways to interact with, with Quill or any character I animate in AR or VR. They'll they'll respond, they can hear like my natural inputs, yeah. my natural form of communication, they can hear it. And then I get to animate responses to that. Like, I can have Quill make eye contact with the player. That's never been able, like, no animator has ever been able to do that before, except for maybe the guy who did worked on Deadpool. <laughs> but that doesn't count. Um, because you know, when you're when you're in film, that's breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. And when you're working on a non-AR VR game, it's kind of creepy that <laughs> characters are looking at you from from a game because you didn't press the look at me button. You know. Yeah. So when a character looks at you in VR, it's like you're you're bonding with their soul. And then how do you animate a character being bonded with? <laughs> no one knows. This is so new. Like that's so interesting to me. Like how do I? portray mm -hmm. psychology now. How do I make a character feel like it's alive, not just to pull a passive participant in, but how do I make them coexist in the room with mm -hmm. you? I could I could imagine a future where, you know, we we animate characters that coexist with us in our apartments or in our homes. You know, where you're 
you boot up the, the, the Quill app on your AR device and you turn on a movie and you're sitting there on your couch and you kind of look over on your AR device next to you on the couch, there's Quill. Having popcorn, watching the movie with you. All of a sudden, she's coexisting in a space. She's acknowledging that you looked at her. She's looking back at you. She might gesture. Like, yeah. we're not doing that right now, but I can imagine a world where that's commonplace, where we're not just animating sword swipes and jumps and guns firing. We're animating virtual friends. We're animating emotive experiences. We're, we're animating companionship. Wow, that's incredible. But it's, it's not easy because the moment you have animation that feels off, the moment your character looks like a puppet or just feels oh, like it doesn't exist in the same world that you exist in, it's a reminder to the player that they're playing a game and that none of this is real. And then it, it kind of breaks the illusion. So now it's, it's a matter of figuring out, well, how much realism do we want? How much cartoon can we get away with? Like, how much expressiveness can are we allowed to do? And where is that line? Like, there's the, the Uncanny Valley line, of course. You don't want to cross into that. And then there's the overly cartoony, you know, Madagascar-style animation line. You don't really want to cross too far over that way because then you might make the player feel like they're not in the world with them anymore. So, like, where is that sweet spot? And... I think that style choices will be expanded and figured out more in the future. I think character expressiveness and how they emote and draw in that 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 participant, like that's there's so much to learn in that field and we're just scratching the surface. And and how all these animations are set up in a more organic way. Because right now everything is explicitly called, like this clip plays, then this clip clip plays, and it's mostly just single clips with a few variants based off of context and some additive poses to help describe looking and pointing in different directions. It's still pretty limited and I think that mm -hmm. animation systems are going to evolve to have more organic clip collection. They're going to evolve to be more organic in their clip choices and you're going to have a lot more animation data to choose from and the way it's going to sort through that data is going to lead to more yeah emotive and organic looking unexpected performances. Right now it's hard to get unexpected responses from characters when you only have so many clip choices that you can use. Mm -hmm. It's really hard thinking about mm -hmm. these systems holistically and, and how to make that character feel real in this, yeah. like, like it's breathing, like it's thinking, like it's looking at you and it's trying to think of what you're thinking, like it's trying to read your mind. How do you animate that? Like. What a great question to ask and what a great job it is to be able to try and explore the answer to that. Yeah, man, it's fantastic to see all those VR games. They're becoming so immersive. It's, it's beautiful. And I remember you told me once that you use your little daughters as inspiration for, you know, the cuteness of Quill. What aspects did you adopt for them? What makes a character's animation look cute in your opinion? <laughs> that's, that's another good question. You know, Quill, Quill actually is my older daughter, because um, back when we were animating Moss, she was three years old. If you've ever watched a three-year-old navigate around a house, they are amazingly cute and very unexpected. And you're just sitting there trying to figure out, like, what is that kid thinking? Yeah. And asking that question is a really great way to draw in a player into your performance, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, used, I used my daughter, my older daughter, um, more as a template and less as a literal like motion capture type situation. <laughs> yeah. I, I did use her for reference on a few occasions, but mostly it was just the question she made me ask about what she's thinking. Mm -hmm. I used to have our players ask that about what Quill could be thinking. So she was more generally inspirational. But what I think works with tiny creatures like Quill in, in, a, in a VR environment is they see themselves as being very serious. Like, mm -hmm. they mean business. I am going to save my uncle. I'm a bold warrior. And you're like, that is so cute. It's a tiny little adorable mouse that thinks it's a bold warrior. Mm -hmm. <gasps> How precious! You know, like, that's just, <laughs> so many people have that reaction. Like, the more serious I made Quill, and the more she's like, stop, stop it. I'm, I mean business. Oh. I'm going to save my uncle. <laughs> Like, the more I do that, the more people would be like, ah, oh, that is so adorable. Mm. And it was because my daughter 
when she had something she wanted to do, she's like, don't laugh at me. I'm going to go climb this chair or whatever uh. she was doing at that moment. And she was dead serious. She had a job to do, but she was a three-year-old adorable toddler doing it. And it just, <laughs> that contrast just killed me. And, and just to be able to, to take that life experience and, and roll that into Quill and ask our players to ask themselves those questions mm -hmm. and make them see this, this contrast between perception of, of what Quill thinks of herself versus reality of what she is. Like, it's just wow. so cute. Ah, oh, that's amazing. I love those things. I was yesterday just hearing the animation department from Ratatouille saying that they used Remy's hands like this, like close to his body, to make him look more vulnerable, actually. And hey, Quill also communicates with sign language. How has it been like to animate that? Oh, sign language, it's it's uh, it's heavy. There's there's a lot to learn when you're animating sign language because it's it's a it's a rich community and it's a very complex language and I, I literally knew nothing about sign language when I decided to do that. We were actually, um, the, the reason we chose to do it was I, I wanted Quill to, to come across as serious and I wanted her to, to have a, a history, have a background, to know some things that maybe the player doesn't know or most players don't know and to be able to use that to get around inside her world which in, implies that her world has been there for a long time and maybe she uses it to communicate with others in her world. And it's also to help make, you know, when she gives her opinion and when she, you know, tries to offer puzzle hints and when she essentially communicates you for whatever reason, she's she's using a real language to do so, but she's, she's using a language that makes sense visually to even people who don't understand sign language. So the challenge for me was trying to to get accuracy correct, to mm -hmm. try and make it feel authentic, like I understood sign language. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of research on every gesture she made to make sure I was doing it right. And I, I learned so much, like when you have, when you're trying to fingerspell stuff, like if you have two L's, like in Quill, you, you do the L twice and you kind of float the second one off to the side to mm -hmm. imply that there was a second L. Um, when you, uh, when you do sign language, you always have to make eye contact, and then you always have to essentially use your dominant hand as opposed to switching hands in the middle of, of signing. Like, there's just so much detail that I had to, to learn that I, when I first started doing it, I had no clue. I just, my first animation, I got very, very lucky. And when I sent it out as a tweet, and everyone just went crazy about it on the internet, I'm like, okay, well, this was a good idea. <laughs> Now I really need to learn how to do this. Yeah. Um, so it was it was challenging. But I also wanted to make sure that if you didn't understand sign language, which the majority of our players don't understand sign language, her communication would still make sense to you. So when she'd say, you know, I'm sad or thank you or whatever she was trying to tell you for a puzzle hint, she'd do it in a way that was expressive enough to where within the context of the situation, you kind of know what she's trying to tell you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think any ambiguity there was in her communication just made her feel more real. Wow. I think the moment you answer too many questions and you start feeding the player too much information, it's fake. It feels like she's there to serve a gameplay purpose. It doesn't feel like she's there to, to figure out how to overcome the language barrier. I think those questions leaving the answers up to our player's imagination is what makes Quill just so powerful as a character. Yeah. And I think sign language played a big role in that. You know, but on top of all that, that technical stuff and, and the reasons we did it, um, it was actually great being able to um, provide a, an underserved community with this service. Mm. I'd never seen a character in a video game do sign language before. Mm. And when people responded to seeing Quill do that in that tweet that I made, it really just moved me. Oh. Like having people react so strongly to that and seeing how much it meant to them and knowing that I had the opportunity to blaze a trail and, and to do something for this community that desperately needed this to be done. Like to, to be able to leave that kind of an impact and, and that lasting impression with people. It, it meant a lot to me and I, I really didn't want to miss the opportunity. But I also didn't want to screw it up. So that's why I had to work so hard to make sure it came across as authentic as possible. One thing I wanted to discuss with you is that we always imagine artists we admire like if they were 
rock stars, you know? When in the reality, that's a little bit more complicated. And there are many awesome artists like yourself with limitless potential who actually find trouble in gaining confidence. How do you work pushing past insecurities? What would you give people as advice? Oh yeah, insecurity, you know, it's, it, we all suffer from it. You mm -hmm. know, whoever in the moment is, is suffering from it and, and they're holding themselves back for it. And just, I think the trick is to just remember that you're not alone that you know we all have to push past it and we all get caught on plateaus and feeling like something's not working or feeling like we're stuck or we're never going to be good enough um, it's it's human nature mm -hmm. it's it's very common and i think that once we accept that that it's a given that we're all going to feel that way at times and we forgive ourselves for feeling that way i think it's it's the people who get so hung up on on not feeling that way that they refuse to allow themselves to feel it that they won't forgive themselves and i think those are the ones that actually get stuck there longer for me when whenever i'm because I, i hit plateaus a lot you know 20 years of doing this of course i've hit numerous plateaus in in you know the last <laughs> the last few weeks actually it's it's uh it's debilitating at times but i think for me i've gotten so used to having those moments that I just don't let them get to me anymore. I just accept that they're happening. I understand that I'm not alone. And then I'm patient with myself. And I find other ways to entertain myself. Like I, you know, I figure out well, what is this animation? Like why, why am I feeling this, this way now? Is it something happening in my life? Is it something about this clip that is not working for me? Is it something about this project that's not working for me? You know, I'll try and reason through whatever changes I need to make in my life or my clip, you know, whatever the scale is that we're talking about here, and try and, and reason through what I need to do to, to fix those things. Back when when I was still at Bungie, um, I, I was pretty happy there. Like, it's a really good studio. We didn't crunch that much. I got paid reasonable wages, you know, was able to support my family. And Destiny was, was pretty fun to work on, but... I'd been working on super soldiers with guns for a long, long time yeah. by that point, and I wanted to strike out and try something different, something where it held more sway over studio decisions mm -hmm. and where I got to have a little bit more creative autonomy. I decided that because I, I felt like I was plateauing. I felt like I was stuck. Even though I was enjoying the work I was doing on Destiny, I didn't feel like it was all that different from the work I had done in the years before. So I had to reason through what I needed to do to, to fix it for myself. So I, I began by forgiving myself for feeling that way. Mm. Understanding that it's common and that everyone who's been on a project or working on a, a type of game for over 10 years is going to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And ask myself, well, what do I need to do to, to resolve the, the problem? And, and took, took years to come up with what I thought the, the right solution would be. And the right solution turned out to be a, a huge risk where I'd go to a, you know, work with a bunch of friends and we're not making any money and I'm worried about supporting my family, but, but it ended up working out. So um, I think, yeah, just be patient with yourself, forgive yourself, reason through your situation, make appropriate changes, or just wait it out if it's just a, uh, Um, you know, temporary thing. That's very inspirational. You know, whenever I'm having a conversation and somebody says like, hey, this or that animator is very technical, I automatically think of you. You always pop in my mind because you work super fast rigging and scripting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Elsa. It doesn't come naturally at all to me. It's because I'm terrible at, at script writing. I, I am not a math brain. Like I, <laughs> when I tip at restaurants, and it's time to calculate it, I'll either just tip a, a, a whole number, roughly about 20%, or I'll just type it, put in the word math and let them figure it out. <laughs> and it's, I, I just, I'm terrible with numbers, I'm terrible with math. Um, but, you know, the, the cool thing, like in, in my situation, I think the reason I'm perceived as being technical is because of the experiences I've had and the need to be able to overcome those experiences. So when I first got to Monolith, Uh, we we were working in Maya, and I had never really worked in Maya before. This was in 2004, and uh, we didn't have animation rigs. We just had characters with bones in them. 
our uh, our art art lead uh, Matt, um, who I adore, uh, said, you know, here's here's how you create a locator, and here's how you bake the locator to your bones. That's good enough for a rig. Go. <laughs> Holy shit! Are you serious? Okay. So uh, let's figure this out then. So I started figuring out ways to animate the character using that technique, and it was just the basic idea of transferring motion to something and using it to reverse the constraint, constraint, and control the bones with it. And I started broadening that approach. Like, okay, well now I'm gonna do that by doing, you know, I put this in world space, and now I can put the chest in this space, I put the head in this space, and I start playing with all these different spatial situations and start developing this this crazy workflow that I've got over over the years of experimenting with different approaches using this this trick I've actually created a really good pipeline for polyarch based on all the answers I've figured out just being inside of Maya and saying man I'm spending a lot of time counter animating blah well how do I use these tricks to not counter animate or make this more efficient or make my life easier and I didn't script a damn thing at first. I just did it all by hand manually inside of Maya. Yeah. And then I noticed that the output window does the scripting for me. Kind of like when I write math on a receipt. Mm -hmm. I know that the, <laughs> the waitress is going to handle that for me. <laughs> um, the, the output window in Maya was handling my math receipt for me. Yeah. So I could just copy that and paste it in later. And then all of a sudden I could make buttons. And it just kind of snowballed. Um, and I started learning how to script from doing that because I'm constantly exposed to the output window so I'm, oh I see this command, oh I see this command and I start learning what the commands are doing and how the syntax works and all that kind of stuff. So I've had over the years a lot of people email me like, oh you know what programming language should I learn? I'm like, fuck if I know. Like, I, If you want to be an animator don't learn a programming language, learn how to animate. You know, that That's really what you need to know to be a good animator. Mm -hmm. This workflow stuff will make your life a lot easier, uh, but it's not how to animate. It's True. how to animate better, <laughs> but you still need to know animation first. Python, Mel, C Sharp, whatever you want to use to do this kind of work, honestly, it, knowing how to script doesn't mean you understand an animation workflow. Knowing an animation workflow means you understand animation workflow. And it's easier to know what to script if you know how to animate, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So even though it's perceived that I, I'm kind of this technical guy, it really just is life experience. It's just circumstance, and it's just kind of evolved into what it is. Um, God, I hope no one ever tries to hire me for my Python skills. <laughs> They're horrible. I'm learning so much on a regular basis. Please share with us a little bit about your online school, maybe some plans for the future. Um, people could be interested in it. Thanks. Yeah. So Animation Sherpa, that's the name of my school. And it's it's uh, it's all about, right now, the, the one course I have available is all about my, my crazy workflow that I use uh, at Polyarch. And a lot of the ways I, I script and, and make all of these automation scripts. You know, when animators work, there's a lot of counter animation that they may need to do, or there's a lot of problems that they may need to solve. And right now, when an animator encounters a problem, Oftentimes they'll look at rig features. Does my rig have a solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. And can I use the rig to, to solve it? And that puts the onus on riggers to constantly anticipate what an animator may need when they're working. And when they have to build all of these features into these gigantic omni rigs that can do everything that an animator might potentially need, you get these very, very complex rigs with hundreds of controls and they're kind of hard to use and pressing play means you're gonna get like two frames a second and they're they're really difficult because even some of the solutions are kind of plotting and difficult to use so that this workflow that I teach is bypasses all that crap so mm -hmm. you can just jump right in and always know the proper space to switch your your content into to always be able to work without counter animating ever again and even automate a bunch of your stuff so like animating tails, being able to, to animate spines with essentially like spline AK and FK at the same time very easily. Um, being able to automate like ear flops or like an entire walking robot. There's one class where I take a four-legged robot that's just moving forward in space and just doing simple up-down translation of its legs. Mm -hmm. And I turn that into a really robust jiggle 
crazy oh. weighty robot walk looking thing and it's all through space switching. I don't set another single key from that very stark, very simple looking animation. It's to showcase just how powerful it is to be able to use these different spaces to mm -hmm. create new content that wasn't there before. It's kind of like generating mocap without using mocap. Mm. Um, you can do that with this workflow and then this course teaches you how. Last, final, ending question. Please tell us about this friend of yours, the great Steve, who's like your right hand, <laughs> but not quite. I can't believe you asked me about Steve. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, when my son was uh, three, four, anyway, he was a, he was a kid. He's yeah. 18 now, but when he was really young, um, I had trouble reaching him all the time, <laughs> um, as any parent struggles to do with a kid, right? So I came up with Roy and Steve. So. Roy is the right hand, Steve's the left hand, um, and they'd talk to Cade and and communicate like like he would open up to them and tell Roy and Steve his darkest desires, you know, of like you know whatever he had going on in the schoolyard or what was going on in his life at that time, and it created this great like um, guilt-free environment for him and I to to communicate where he was talking to Steve, who yeah. was his favorite. He didn't care for Roy. <laughs> he was talking to Steve, not me. Roy was kind of um, my dark side, so mm -hmm. Roy was uh, more of the um, rigid, grumpy um, <laughs> character, kind of like Oscar the Grouch. Yeah. And then Steve was more of the, um, he's more of my, like my light side, my goofy, completely ignorant, um, <laughs> unaware of the world, but very curious about the world mm -hmm. type side. So um, while Roy was busy trying to talk to Cade, Steve would eat his toy Millennium Falcon. My son was just over the moon like, these two characters are crazy. This one's trying to tell me. And then Roy would notice Steve trying to eat it and then try and like talk Steve down off the Falcon. And these two would have this like battle going on. And in my mind, they were real characters having real thoughts, you know, really <laughs> debating this Millennium Falcon. And my son was just fascinated mm -hmm. like these characters are evolving right in front of me and I can tell them anything and I can open up to them and they're they're real to me we went to we went to, to Disney World my son was like seven or eight at the time yeah. and uh, my uh, and and Steve because he didn't he didn't care for Rory going on the rides with them but he wanted Steve to go on the rides with them so Steve would always be over his shoulder yeah <laughs> you know, we go down Splash Mountain Aww. And my son would just giggle his fool head off at the whole thing. And now I've got two little girls, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they adore Roy and Steve. Mm -hmm. um, again, Steve more than Roy, but you know, I, I think maybe I could work on Roy's personality a bit, and maybe <laughs> balance it out a little bit more. I, don't know. <laughs> I love that story. That's why people like you need to be in this industry. Thanks for being in the show today. You are so tenacious, so inspiring, and. You're always full of talent, man. Thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you so much, Elsa. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity mm -hmm. to be here. And I've been really, really enjoying all the episodes you've put out of World Space. And I really like the name. <laughs> I think I think the name's a great name. Thank Keep you. it up. Uh, can't wait to see more. And thanks again so much. That was Richard Lico, everybody. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't so you don't miss any of the videos. Leave me a comment down below if you're interested. And hey, guess what? Trikingo is a site where you can download many different tools and tutorials. If you are an animator, if you want to learn scripting, if you want to even learn how to make your own video game, it doesn't matter if you're highly experienced or you're new to the industry. There is content for all kinds of CG artists. You can see these tools being used over and over again in the pipelines of the most important studios around the world. My subscribers and I get a 20% discount in any purchase. There's even free stuff to play around with. I will leave you guys a link in the description down below. Make sure to check it out. Keep making art, you beautiful artist. <laughs>